Oh! oh. Well, Jesus carried a cross, didn't he? 
He carried his cross to Calvary. Do you know where Calvary is? That is where Jesus died on the cross so that we could have everlasting life. So we have to make our decision. Do we pick up our cross and follow Jesus? So that's a decision that is very hard to make. And I want you to think about that every day. Every morning when you get up and you say your prayer for the day, then think about Jesus and tell him, I want to follow you today. But sometimes we need help. How do we get help? Do you know how we get help to follow Jesus? We pray and we ask him to help us. So let's bow our heads and pray right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for carrying your cross to Calvary. Help us each day to pick up our cross and follow you. Amen. And I have a thing that you could work out for today to help you to follow Jesus. Thank you, ladies. Shake. 
shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now, all of you, from your evil way and amend your ways and your doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God spoke to Jeremiah and he told him to go down to the potter's house and there he will let you hear, I will let you hear my words. And of course Jeremiah went down to the potter's house and he, and he saw the potter and he was sitting there working with a lump of clay and the potter messed up whatever it was he was working on. If, ever, if, you've, ever, if you've ever tried to make pottery, you know that if just a little bit of pressure at the wrong time and the wrong place and the whole thing just kind of falls apart and this is what happens and, and so the, the potter just swooshed it all back down into the middle and he started over, made something else. Now God's word to Jeremiah was a word of judgment against Israel. God, the potter, was going to be starting over. But what I want you to see in this is the imagery of God as the potter and us people, us human creatures as the clay. And this is used many times in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 9 says, Woe to you who strive or argue against or with your maker, earthen vessels with the potter. Does the clay say to the one who fashions it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles. And Isaiah also says elsewhere, you, you turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay? Now we sing, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. We are, you are the potter, I am the clay. See how you get that mixed up? Okay, thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still. There's my solo. <laughs> Lord, Lori said I had to sing a solo because I missed choir practice <laughs> last Thursday, and there it is. Choir, choir practice on Thursday nights at 6.30. We need all the help we can get. You just heard that. How easy it is to get those words mixed up. Okay, but how often do we think and, if, and behave as if the words were, I am the potter and you are the clay. How often do we try to make God into something that suits our desires and fulfills our needs. And how often do we not listen to or, or not even know the Word of God? And we come before Him with some preconceived notions or, or wishful thinking about who God is and, and what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is where the title of today's sermon comes from. Great God is great, and, and you are not, and, and I'm not. And Jesus had large crowds following him. And he must have known or, or sensed that there were people in those crowds that had this same problem. They didn't understand what Jesus was all about. And many perhaps wanted to get something from Jesus. Maybe they, they needed healing. Uh, maybe they just wanted to be a part of the, the latest excitement in town. And, and maybe they just wanted a good show. You know, they wanted to see what miracle Jesus would do next. And so Jesus says something here that, at least for us, we find shocking. Now, whether the, the people back then uh, felt that way, it's uncertain. But it gets our attention, doesn't it? I mean, how could Jesus, with this kind, gentle, let the children come to me kind of demeanor, how could Jesus tell us to hate anyone? Yeah. Much less to hate our families 
you know, you know, mothers and fathers who nurtured us and and our spouses tenderly loved and, and our children, the little ones uh, that depend so much on us. How, how could Jesus say something like this? Well, before we throw our Bibles out, we have to understand that he didn't mean it. Or at least not in the way we think. What Jesus was saying was hyperbole. Okay, it was a wild exaggeration. Or some commenters, commentators will say that, that the word that we translate here as hate is actually used, this is a quite common use of that word in, the, in much of the Bible. And it doesn't really mean to revile someone, but it means to love them less well. They love them less well. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you don't put me first above mother and father and family and even life itself, then you cannot be my disciple. Put Jesus first. Everything else is secondary. And Jesus is talking about discipleship. And the first thing he says about it is that in order to be his disciple, you have to die. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now this wasn't about sacrificing time and money or, or doing some extra work or, or putting up with some difficult situations or maybe difficult people. Okay, that's not what carrying your cross means. Okay, carrying your cro the cross the cross was an instrument of death. And to carry your cross meant that you were on your way to die. You were going to die. Now again, Jesus was not calling for mass executions here. This was hyperbole. But think about it. Think about it. Over the summer, I got hooked on reruns of Battlestar Galactica. All right. All right. <laughs> and in one episode, the the fighter pilots were being sent out every day on these very dangerous missions to fight the enemy, and many of them were being killed. They weren't coming back. And and someone asked one of the pilots how she does it, how she gets in that that fighter space thing, and go out every single time and she says you just consider that you're already dead and then there's nothing left to fear you just consider that you're already dead Jesus is telling us that we need to die to ourselves we need to give up control of our lives in order for us to live as the people we are. People who have been reborn in the Spirit. We are saved. And when we put Christ first in our lives, only then can we be disciples of Christ. Now Jesus is still speaking to these large crowds of people and and these are people who have various motives for being there, or, or maybe they just didn't know. Maybe they just didn't know. They're, they're looking to see what it's all about. But Jesus isn't interested in having large crowds. And I guess for him, large crowds are a pain. I mean, you look through the Gospels, and they're always pressing in around him, and they're always grabbing at him, wanting to touch him. And, and then after a while, he's got to feed them. And, and then he's got to clean up the leftovers. Doesn't like to have large crowds. Just having a lot of people around isn't his desire. I remember back when I was a young army officer in Georgia. I joined the Tobacco Road JCs. They were having a membership drive and, and everybody was, was signing up. Back the road, JCs won a won an award that year for being the the the.
chapter in the whole country with the greatest membership growth. The next year, they didn't exist. The people had been happy to sign up, but there was no substance there. There was, there was nothing behind it. There was no meaning. And no one had explained to them the cost of membership. People want meaning. They want to know about the significance of what they're doing. That even if it's hard, even if it disrupts their, their lives' routine, and even if their plans and their goals for their lives are, are changed, they'll stick with it. Because it means something to them. It means something, something that's ultimately bigger than they are. Jesus gave us two examples of weighing the cost of discipleship. He talks about building a tower without first estimating the cost and seeing if there's enough to complete it. And that would be foolish, wouldn't it? Have you ever built a house or remodeled one or put a roof on a church? Maybe you know what he's talking about. And then he talks about a king going to war without first considering the cost and seeing if there is enough to defeat the enemy. That would be foolish. And our government is doing this right now. They are uh, deliberating on, or will be deliberating on, on this situation with Syria. And we all pray that they're going to be wise in their deliberations. Now we here in the tri-towns, we should also weigh the cost of discipleship. These little ones here. When they get a little bit older and they, get, they start thinking about making their profession of faith, will we be able to teach them what it means to be a member of this church? Will we be able to teach them what it means to be a disciple of Christ? Will they have the tools to weigh the cost? Okay, this is our catechesis. Now, I told you before that we're going to hear this word again, and here it is. Okay, this is the knowledge, it's catechesis, it's the knowledge and the teaching that passes on our identity to new Christians and to the next generation. Now, if we are able to do this, then their identity as Christians will have meaning maybe we'll learn something as well. They will grow. And as they look out over the long arc of their lives, this, this will be important to them, that they are disciples of Jesus Christ. And I think that before we can teach these little ones, and before we can ask them to make sacrifices of their lives as disciples, then we need to do this ourselves. Now today starts a time of year in this church in which a lot is going on. Sunday school has started, the choir is back, choir rehearsal at 6.30 on Thursday evenings. <laughs> Did I plug that enough? There's planning going on in the Presbyterian women and the various Tri-Town Ministries, uh, Jeannie and the Church Women United, uh, for all of the events coming up in the fall and, and around Thanksgiving and, and the Christmas season. Uh, the food pantry is as, big, as busy as ever and expanding every day. And the building and grounds people are, are beginning to, to deal with the the issues of the building and, and the newly exposed southern exposure here. Um, the session at our next meeting will be considering many other activities for the church. We have lots of people who are doing lots and lots of things and making sacrifices for God's mission here in this church. This is what I'm going to ask you to do starting today and for the next several weeks. I want you to consider 
what this means. What does it mean? How does all this activity fit into our catechesis? How does it fit into who we are as Presbyterian Christians in the Tri-Towns? How does it fit in with God's Word? This is the context that gives meaning to all that we do. Knowing this, knowing how all of this, this fits together is what makes what we do important. It makes it a priority in our lives rather than just one or two more obligations added to already hectic schedules. So will you do that? All God's people said, Amen. They are very important people to the future of this church. But please, please don't forget that we are all teachers in everything that we do and even in the things that we don't do. Amen.